anyone who's ever tracked a deer knows that these things can go where no human should be able to go. And these little dogs go anywhere. A deer can go. And deer can go through some amazingly tight spots. Isn't that kind of a challenge for you? Because they're on a leash, so if they're going under branches, so are you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. It's deer season. Most of my friends are having their usual luck. None. But it's still a good walk in the woods. Some friends have been successful, and some need a little help. Suzanne Hamilton is a blood tracker. She and her dogs are on call whenever a wounded game animal disappears. Trained dogs can often aid in the recovery. Nationally, there's an organization called United Blood Trackers. There are at least five members in this state, and I've had Lindsay Ware on the show a couple of times before. She's from Ellsworth. She and Suzanne often get together, and their dogs are amazingly talented. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Dice Arts, EBS, and Napa Auto Parts. For non-hunters, today's show is a fascinating tale about some spirited and talented dogs. For hunters, listen carefully. Even if you never need help from a blood tracker, today's show is loaded with tips on how to recover your game. Suzanne Hamilton, welcome to the program. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. You are from Montville, if I'm correct. I live in Montville, Maine. Yes, South Montville. Well, let's find out a little bit about Suzanne Hamilton before we get, go any further. You live in Montville. I, I believe from your website you have two very experienced dogs. I do. Is, I do. They're great dogs. Is one of them the emergency backup dog, or how do you work that? <laughs> no. I started 12 years ago with, with a prodigy and, uh, and uh, eventually knew I had to get a second one when he got older uh, and uh, kept one of his daughters. So. Mm-hmm. She's stepping into some awful big shoes, but she's doing a spectacular job. And right nowadays we have, you know, she takes on most of the really difficult, long, harder tracks while he's, I'm, I'm you know, I, I do a lot of interviewing before I take tracks, and I, the ones that sound like, you know, he can handle physically, I, he does while he can. Yeah. So. The interviewing is really the important part because, uh Every situation is kind of different, and what you're able to do really depends on what the hunters have done. Yes, yes, and I and I have to say, it, you know, it, shot analysis is important, and it, 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 I think it needs the most education. You know, 90% of the time you go, what was at the hit side? What did you see? And a lot of people don't zero in on the hit side. They zero in the way they lost last saw the deer go in where and there's so much information at the hit site itself that's important to figure out what kind of shot it is you know it, so many times when when someone calls me the first thing i get is i, I was a good shot it's definitely dead <laughs> and, and much <laughs> of the time they're wrong well yeah <laughs> i i just know it's dead i just know it was a good hit well I never see good hits because um, good hits, good hits. You don't need me right. for a good hit. Um, I, but what can differentiate a good hit from you know a hit that goes wrong? And I never call it bad hit because I'm make pe- people feel bad because a hit go wrong happens to the best of the best of the best, to most experienced hunters, most ethical hunters, people that take the most care. Uh, that deer takes a breath, looks the other way, and you can miss that vital organ that you were aiming for, and it it takes nothing, and right. then a dog is needed. No, that's exactly it. I mean, ethical hunters are actually the people who are calling you to make sure they can track down a wounded animal. Absolutely, so. and I can tell you, I've made more friends in my time that I've done this than I it was even thought possible. It's just I've met some amazing people. Well, let's, let's go back and meet your dogs again. What are their names? Okay, I have Buster and Maggie, and they are European wire-haired dachshunds. Now, they have very little resemblance with our normal U.S. AKC-type dachshund. They um, uh, they're, have longer legs. They're a little higher off the ground. They're a little bit like weasels. They can move very, very quickly, have a lot of stamina, and um, they are bred specifically to do this. These are not dogs that, uh, you know, are ailed with uh, some of those back problems. 
Mm-hmm. Like like they have oftentimes in those really, really beefy standard American dachshunds who are also wonderful and cute and funny, but they're not made to do this kind of work. Right, which is good um, because anyone who hears the word dachshund taking them out in the field to track, they're kind of snickering. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I've had, I've had... I've had the looks when I've arrived with my little dogs. I really have. And people expect you to come out with a big bloodhound, and, mm-hmm. and there's this little dog, and you wrap him up in a blanket on a 17-degree night because you know you're going to go on a long trailer, you know, SUV ride or something to get into the field, and, uh, I mean, four-wheeler ride. And so, you know, wrap up your dog. And I, I remember one of the first guys I've ever tracked for, he he said years later he he admitted he says you know first time I ever saw this I walked in the kitchen with my wife and I said that dog is going to freeze to the very first tree it's going to piss on you you know that right and we're going to be done we're going to probably be back in five minutes and that same dog and that was Buster hit I mean they just explaining to me where it went and I put the dog down and he's like an arrow and that that's the next thing is. People have no idea how fast these dogs work. Uh, most of the people go, well, I would love to like Spot for Blood, but I have a really hard time keeping up. And So these are really agile little animals. And I think actually it's uh, uh, an asset that they're, that they're short and long because they go under branches, in between brush. I mean, they, they fit because anyone who's ever tracked a deer knows that these things can go where no human should be able to go. These little dogs go anywhere. A deer can go. And well, deer can go through some amazingly tight spots. Isn't that kind of a challenge for you? Because they're on a leash, so if they're going under branches, so are you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I've had the occasion situation where I'd have to say, someone hang on to the end of the leash, please. And I'd go around it and you know, fetch the dog on the other side because they're unstoppable. I mean, I probably couldn't call them back mm-hmm. um, if I if I lost them. So, uh, yeah, they're on a 30-foot leash, and it's been challenging at times, absolutely. Well, mm-hmm. a 30-foot leash must also get caught in brush and branches. And no, things. I've no? got a really good leash. It's, no. uh, I used to track with a, a German leather hunting leash. That got... Uh, that got... Um, itself hung up quite a bit, especially when it got wet. And then um, what's really popular with some trackers is these uh, climbing nylon ropes. Mm-hmm. But I also found them that if they get wet, your your hand stays wet all night when you're tracking. I now have this neoprene. It's specifically made for blood tracking. Uh, we have them on our United Blood Trackers w- website at the, at the store. They have fantastic leashes because they can smear through water, guts, blood, no matter what, and they're easily wiped off and they're clean again and yeah. they don't keep your hands wet. Are there ever occasions where you have both dogs going at once or is this really a matter no. of them taking turns? No, no, they compete. If, if you take them together, you're going to have a foot race. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is you're so busy tracking these days that if you take, you know, very specifically check which track goes to which dog at this point and... And we're so busy, you don't want to wear out two dogs on one track yeah, anyway. That's true. Is there uh, something that one dog is better at than the other? Um, at this point, obviously, the young dog has got a lot more stamina. And while Buster didn't mind swimming through swamps and stuff at a younger age, it's not really something he wants to do at this point. But he's the guy that, on the calls that I take where people have truly searched for a long time, which I always encourage people just call in if the blood gets thin and they have questions, call before you start grid searching. But if you end up on a track where people have searched, he's the guy that will sort it all out carefully. And, and while I'm saying that, I'm pangs of guilt because my young dog, Maggie, the four-year-old, is um, just just as unbelievable at this by now, you mm-hmm. know. So it, it's she's can't really say any more better uh, that he's still better than that. He's very methodical, and he's very tempered at it. She's still sometimes a little wild, but she gets the same job done at this point. My guest is Suzanne Hamilton. She's a very experienced blood tracker in the company of her two dogs, Buster and Maggie. Buster is somewhat of a legend among bow hunters. We'll get to that in a moment. 
Also, some tips on recovering game animals later on the show. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, and the radio station brave enough to air it is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. The show now airs twice each weekend, Saturday morning at 9 and Sunday morning at 8. Suzanne Hamilton is a blood tracker. When a wounded deer gets away and can't be found, Suzanne often gets the call. She's got two dogs who can help track it. Maggie is four years old. Maggie's father is Buster. He's 12, and I believe he has been made an official mascot among bow hunters, Suzanne. Well, yeah, we call him. We, we, he's, it's probably not official, but way back when um, I used to not track much in Maine because no one knew about us, but when they started that blip hunt um, years ago on Marsh Island um, and they needed my help, I started staying home instead of going to opening season in Vermont and... Um, you know, he became sort of their dog to make sure all their deers got harvested. And, I mean, these people do a spectacular job. They did a spectacular job at what they were doing, and um, they they lost very, very few deer, I believe. And um, the ones that I tracked were generally deer that were mortally wounded, and we did catch up with, I'd say, 98% of them. Yeah. Now, you track for deer, bear, and moose, but you... Also live in Montville, so you can't be tracking moose very often. Oh, moose is right. I think last year I took four moose calls. This year I only took one so far. Um, it varies. I've had calls in southern Maine on moose. I, I've, I've traveled once four hours to moose in uh, Presque Isle, was it? Mm-hmm. It was um, one of those calls where I already uh, had three calls that day, and we were pretty tired, and I had... You know, I, I was mostly tr- using Buster. I think I put Maggie on some other track, and I got a call from a from a good friend from down south who said, "No, no." And I thought, "Well, we have a call down south." When I looked at the number, and they said, "Well, we actually four hours from you, and we just would like your opinion." And um, they ended up having the shot on camera, and when uh, I realized that it was very likely to be a paunched moose, and they had tracked it for a quarter mile, um, and they'd lost the trail and bad raspberries, and I said, you know what, it's going to be dead moose, so I'm just, I'm just going to do it, whatever. <laughs> That's pretty generous of you, because you don't actually charge anybody. You will take donations for expenses. But... Uh, yes, but I, people always do take care of me, and, I, and these turned out, you know, these, these have become friends so i i did i drive i drove the four hours and i you know and they thought i was crazy actually doing it but you know when you know like these pawn shots you know it's a dead animal in the end and you don't want to go wanted to go to coyotes and it would have been tough finding it because it actually after they lost the trail went another quarter mile before it lay down and uh when we got there busted had no problem finding it but it was actually still alive and got up and we were able to put it out of its misery right then and there so mm-hmm. it was uh was was a good call to make you know had i gone up there for a high back hit probably not <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> well what is the number one mistake hunters make what is the number one mistake hunters make yeah the number one mistake uh, that you know messes up your ability to go find a deer okay my ability to track is that while in the effort to do everything that they can before getting a dog out last resort is they walk around too much. Mm-hmm. It's when you think you can step, and people say, oh, I've been really careful not to step. You can step and drop a blood you didn't even know was there. And everywhere you walk for the next two hours, every footprint has that little particle on it. And now make that three or four guys and, you know, the longer you're out there, the more you walk around, the harder it is for the dog. And the dog will try his best to sort out all the footprints versus all the, you know, versus finding the track of the gland of the deer that's connected with the blood. But, it, it you know, you end up having the dog out there for half an hour just working his little soul out, trying to find, extend the line. It, it, Sometimes there's no choice. Sometimes people just didn't know. And so 
the thing that I do is I say, well, you know, we'll come out, we'll take a look at this, we'll see that the dog can sort through it. But in the future, it would be so great if you knew that this makes it hard. And, and people actually see it, you know. I, I've watched people go, oh, my God, I can see that's right where I walked. And, you know, the so dog is circling right, circling left, making the circles bigger, scoping the area, coming back. I mean, they do this systematic, it's amazing to watch, actually. But um, there goes an hour of dog that could go put, be put to use for someone else finding an animal. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it, it's their skill. It, so I always try to educate people. Say, you know what? If you ever need me again, just if you see that the blood trail is getting thinner or you guys are having a hard time, you find yourself you needing to start circle a lot, just, just mark it well where you are and call. And that's the other, that's the other thing that um, hunters make it hard is not knowing where the blood trail is. The general answer is, ah, oh, I can lead you right to it. I know right where it is. <laughs> well, it was somewhere in here. Right. So they didn't flag it. They didn't flag it. And somewhere in here kind of doesn't cut it because if there was a deer three feet from where this deer was and I put my dog on that track, then that is the deer they're going to track. Yeah. So it's really important that I have... Some blood sign, some, you know, not... I mean, I've gone once, I drove two hours, and they never did find the spot that we needed to go on. And Frustrating, it isn't it? It makes it hard. <laughs> yeah, it makes it frustrating. Yeah. So. Blood tracking is today's topic on Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. It's the use of dogs to track mortally wounded game animals. Even if you're not a hunter, it's pretty interesting to see what these talented little dogs can do. Suzanne Hamilton is my guest. Up next, I'll ask Suzanne if she ever gets to a track site, looks at everything trampled down by the previous search, and says, Uh-oh. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. When someone asks, got your deer yet? The answer is usually yes or no. Sometimes it's maybe. You know you hit it, but you can't find it. You and your buddies search the woods for a while, but still no luck. At that point, Suzanne Hamilton might get a call. She's a blood tracker, been doing it for years. Her dogs, Buster and Maggie, have an uncanny ability to find and recover game animals that would have otherwise gone to waste or suffered unnecessarily. So I'm wondering, Suzanne, if you ever get to a site to begin tracking, look at the trampled down, unsuccessful search before you got there and say to yourself, uh-oh. Well, I asked people that before. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 I get a really good sense of if people have been honest with me or not really quickly because I ask actually a lot of questions. You know, when people, some people get annoyed with me asking questions, and I, I, I get that too, but... You know, I have to ask questions in order to sort of put the piece of the puzzle together for myself a little bit. Because while <laughs> we don't charge for the service, um, we just take the donation, it's still in the end. I get to make the call if I want to take this or not. You've got to know which dog to bring, if nothing else. If nothing else, which dog to bring. And, if, you know, and then sometimes it's do I want to drive two hours or do I want... I'm dead tired, I've trucked all day, do I want to take this call, you know, or do I want to, um, it's not just my dogs, you know, I have, we have this wonderful little network of trackers at this point, you know, like with Lindsay Ware and Scott Klontz, and it, they're such good friends, and we always, you know, someone calls, they call me because I've done this so long, if they have any questions, they call me just like I used to call my mentors all the time, um, about stuff and still will on occasion. Um, and, you know, I may say, you know, something might come in and say, well, this is really a great call for Lindsay's dog to take. You know, say, for example, it went through some uh, swampy stuff or, you know, this is a, a lab who's, like, got long legs who can just plow through that stuff like there's no tomorrow while mine might, might struggle. So um, I get to, you know, I... I get to get a picture of the situation, and I can actually also say, you know, 
I think I've got the right person for you to track that deer. Mm-hmm. And so, or I may get, I may say, you know what, I, it's just not good for me to come out on this call because, you know, this sounds like it's going to be another three-hour lake hit, which we love lake. I mean, we we love taking them, you know, because we can often get them. But, you know, <clears throat> if my dogs have just run all day and I only have little Buster left who was 12 years old, at this point, you know, and I may opt not to take it, and um, but I'm always happy to help out with well, certainly else who can. Now that people are finding out more and more that uh, United Blood Trackers is in Maine and there are some good volunteers around, the demand yeah. must be really rising, and you must be getting awfully busy. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> how many yeah. would, you, would you track in a day? I mean, uh, how many how many calls do you handle? Oh, it depends. You know, I'll take a couple of calls a day. I've taken four a day. Mm-hmm. On occasion, I, on Youth Day, we have uh, we had uh, we found three deer out of four calls, and I myself, you know, with two dogs, each dog got to run two tracks, and yeah, yeah. So, do you think a wounded deer tries to throw you off? Track? Oh God, yes. Yes. Oh my God, so that's why you actually need a no- dog, not just with a nose, but also a brain. Yeah. So, what are some you of the know? tricks a deer will do? Oh, they backtrack. Mm-hmm. They you know, they backtrack often. I just tracked one the other day that went, I swear went 200 yards. A guy, great guy, super hunter, said, you know, we, we really are just, you know, we are going backwards. And I said, yeah, let's give it a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> and then there, lo and behold, and all the dry blood we had, and there was a little bit of wet blood that looked fresh. And, you know, the dog, my dogs don't get thrown off to that, off that too easily. Um, and most dogs that do this for a while catch on to that. The other thing that often happens is we track a deer and it's still alive, and especially bucks, they will do this little J-hook before they lay down in bed, and they are hoping you walk right by them. So what happens to me is I walk right by them, I don't see them. The dog does a 10-yard turn and jumps on top of the deer, or we walk by them, and just as we've walked by them, they run the other way. You know, I've had... Some hunters really close to uh, wetting themselves because <laughs> they had a deer coming right at them, <laughs> you know, in the dark. A lot of our tracking is in the dark. Yep. So it's, it's, uh, How often does a deer go somewhere where no one else, including the dog, wants to go? You know, a, a wet area or a swamp or something. They go in swamps, but the dogs go right in there, too, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, but they're on a leash, so that means you go in there, too. Uh, yeah, I go in, too. Oh. Oh, God, you know. God bless you. Uh, I've been up to my chest. I, I try to avoid that, especially in November. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, how often do you train? Do you train throughout the year, or is this something that I, I don't... Act- I shouldn't be saying this. I don't train at all. <laughs> my dogs are professionals. <laughs> Hunting season comes around, and the first bear call comes in in August. Uh-huh. I pull out my little baskets, and the dogs don't leave my side. They're just glued to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Especially with the older one now. Are there some days where Buster really just wants to lay by the fire and not go out on these calls? Or? No. No. Uh-uh. no. When I talk hunting, like right at this moment, mm-hmm. they are sitting here and staring at me. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Do they, do they expect some kind of a reward, or are they just doing it for fun? They, I like to give them the reward, but I think the biggest reward for them is to find the deer mm-hmm. and to they lay into it a little bit. They, Buster likes to pull out some hair by their butt, and Maggie actually occasionally likes to deglove their tail. But um, but you know what the heck for reward, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, they, you know, and sometimes when it's convenient and we're gutting the deer, I have the dogs get a little piece of heart or something. Mm-hmm. They like they enjoy that. They don't like liver. Yeah. They're actually a snobby that way. Uh-huh. I can't say that I blame them. No, right. I like liver better than they do. <laughs> I, but, um, yeah, no, they, they're they picky. And they just love to go. Like, you know, little Buster who's 12 years old. has got a little bit of a heart murmur now. And, you know, he's getting in his old age sometimes, you know. I can't really call him Tubby, but I, you know. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, he, 
you know, I can throw him in the snow, in the swamp. If it's to do with tracking, he, I think he would die before he would stop wanting to track a deer for yeah. me. And so I have to be his advocate and have to take care of him and really be picky and choosy about what I put him on. Mm -hmm. um, because he would just do it just because that's the number one thing he loves the most. Yeah. Always. The voice you are hearing belongs to Suzanne Hamilton. She's a blood tracker, along with her two dogs, Buster and Maggie. So I'm wondering if you've ever tracked a wounded animal and you catch up with it and it's still healthy enough to get really, really mad at you. That question is the next question, as Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine continues on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. I'm Bob Duchesne, host of Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, and for today's show, I'm joined by Suzanne Hamilton. She's one of at least five volunteer blood trackers in the state. When a game animal needs to be recovered but the trail has gotten lost, blood trackers sometimes get the call to help. They're volunteers, but of course they do appreciate help paying for their expenses. Most have full-time jobs, and this time of year can keep them up half the night. That is some pretty serious dedication to helping hunters. Now, I'm wondering, Suzanne, if you've ever gotten out there tracking a wounded animal and find one that isn't yet dead. In fact, it's kind of mad at you. Um, it, it's never happened to me. It's happened to a friend of mine mm. in New York. And he, he, it was a small buck. It's only a four-point. It was a little buck with a big heart. And uh, he ran at him the first time, actually gored the dog. Um, and um, but he didn't realize that at the time the dog was still tracking, and the second time the deer came at him, he came to with one of the antlers of the deer in his hand. Ah. And um, he's an older gentleman. He's the one that wrote the book on um, tracking wounded deer with dogs, mm -hmm. John Johnny. And um, that story will always be in my mind. That little that antler is on his desk. There's something we should never forget that these animals can still be aggressive. Yeah. Now, the best tracking dogs are often pretty small, like yours are relatively small. So how does a lot of snow affect their performance? Snow? Yes. I can't run them in deep snow, really. They're too little. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, then it's when I call my friend Lindsay and say, ha, <laughs> you've got one with long legs. <laughs> yeah, I have but, met that dog, and that dog is full of energy, and I don't think snow slows that one down. No, snow wouldn't slow him down at all, not even a bit. And, um, you know, it's one of those situations you don't really have any evidence because oftentimes the blood trails underneath and just trust the dog and go and mm -hmm. he's got long legs. You know, I, I can go in what we just had. Two, three inches is not a problem. But I, if I take my little dog in eight inches of snow and all they do is have to leap over it, it's just kind of not fair yeah. to them. And, you know... And, and truly, if you think of it, most people can track their own deer in that. that actually, I suppose that's true, too. Now, was there, how, how often do you get a deer that you say to yourself, man, we're never going to find this one, and then suddenly there it is? Oh, that happens all the time. Yeah. It's sort of, it's become the rule that when you say, okay, I'm, I think I'm ready to bag it. Let's go just another 100 yards. And it's, it's become one of those rules that most likely that's where it is. So... <laughs> we get we get pretty determined, um, but you know, a lot of times the sign, you know, it it's not, you know, then that we find it. You say, for example, we did Lake Hit Deer the other day, and we tracked it for about three quarter mile, and it didn't really bleed the way it should bleed in order to actually catch up with it because the leg hit deer. It obviously, if no organs are hit. It's not just going to lay down and die because it's got a broken leg. You know, it would be very bad if people died of broken legs, too. Yeah. Um, they just don't do that. They're either going to keep going and you keep bleeding them so that you can take them down, put that meat in the freezer so that they don't get taken down by coyotes sometime late in the winter when the snow is really high. So, you know, you, you track and track and track, and I, you know, we huddled together. I waited for all the hunters to catch up and help my dog who was barking. And I said, so about quarter mile back, 
we jumped that deer. It, we, we didn't see it, but I know by the way the dog is tracking, it's now really hot tracking. And we have not gotten the steer to bleed in a way that we say in a mile or two it's just going to lay down and die. So I said, let's all make a decision if we want to turn around now. Or if you guys are fit and ready to go and well, we'll go get it a little further and see if it won't open up a little bit more. And you know, those guys said, well, we, we're actually good to go if you're willing and I'm willing if you are. So <laughs> it wasn't 30, 40 yards later that we came up on a huge puddle of blood. And I think it had just started pushing through some bones been grinding cutting and yeah. it started to bleed much better and it was another um, half mile when we jumped it and eventually ended up with it so is there a strategy to that i mean do you want to push a deer hard enough that it's actually leaving a trail for you but you don't want to really jump it so that it runs away well it all depends on the injury yeah you know which is like why you do the interview why do the interview yeah i mean the, the general consensus is that if you have a bone hit deer, you have bone on the hit side, by gosh, do not wait. Don't wait at all. Push like crazy. While you're pushing in the woods, call a tracker. Get on it. Don't let it stop bleeding because you can get it. If you, um, Where, say, you have a pond sh shot deer, um, you know, where you hit the stomach, it's a very different story. You, it's best if it's recognized right away because that deer is likely to go 200 yards, lay down, and take its time to die. And I always say with, with gun hits, it takes four, four to eight hours. Um, archery, I say eight to 12, even longer sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you let that deer sit. Now, you've waited long enough, say you've waited long enough, and you go out and you happen to jump it back out again, <laughs> give it more time to die. It'll go another two, 300 yards and lay down. It will expire. Um, but with the paunch hit deer, um, the difference is that it's not going to die in miles. If you push, you, if, if its lifespan, uh, according to the toxins, because of what, what with the stomach, uh, you know, content mixing with the blood, it's, it poisons the animal. So, whether it's an animal that lives four or eight or 12 hours, it's going to live four or eight or 12 hours, whether you push it like crazy or not. So you might as well just leave it sitting. Mm -hmm. um, the liver shot is similar. It takes just some time. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, like when the paunch, it doesn't bleed really well. So now you've jumped it out of the bed for a third time. You can't find any more blood. Now, after following it on its nice little trail with the paunch matter, um, that you probably couldn't see, you grid search the area, well, you've just made this work for the dog a whole lot harder. Hunters are probably pretty good at, uh, you know, experienced hunters are very good at, at uh, finding good places to hunt, sitting in a tree stand, all that hunting part. How educated are hunters about how to handle the deer after it's been shot? Uh, it varies, you yeah. know. Um, I've met super educated people. I love my bow hunters. They're they're in general really in tune with uh, the injuries of the animals because they shoot at such close range. And um, I think there's just an education there in the bow hunting that, um, that is special. Um, but, I, you know, I meet so many fantastic hunters, and they, they know the right answers. They know what I'm saying. But then you meet the uh, others. Where the, and, you know, it's okay. It's, it's totally great. And fine, if you're maybe not so educated, but well, maybe take it from someone who all they see is bad hits or unfortunate hits um, and just talk to them and maybe get edu get ma more educated. Well, that's just them. it. Most of the people are going to have to learn by doing. Um, yeah, or listening to someone who's like, I, I took 66 tracks last year. Mm -hmm. You know, I probably see more unfortunate hits than in one season than uh, even experienced hunters see in their whole lifetime. Now that's experience. And since Suzanne Hamilton has brought that blood tracking experience to Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine this morning, we will get her to summarize with a bunch of tips that might help hunters no matter how much time they've spent in the woods. 
And up next, if you ever do need help from a blood tracker, be sure to tell the whole story. This is Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. You're listening to Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Suzanne Hamilton is my guest. She and her dogs named Buster and Maggie spend countless hours in the woods each fall, tracking down and recovering wounded game animals. She starts by getting every detail on the hit site and the actions of the deer. But... Sometimes people aren't exactly straightforward, you know, they... Oh, you like, think? I, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, well, well, I, you know, I... Then all of a sudden they say, well, I, I shot it again. Oh, you did? Well, you didn't say that the first <laughs> time, you know. Or I, I went on a hit once. This is interesting. I, uh, this guy said, well, I shot it from yay far and... You know, blah, 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 and it was all good, and it fell down, and that was back when I did take high back shots because I was too stupid to know better, and I actually tracked the steer, you know, a nice four, five hundred yards through the wood, and it was dead. Well, it had a broken jaw, and I, mm. I looked at this deer baffled, and I said, no deer dies of a broken jaw overnight. You know, they die two weeks three weeks later of complete starvation, right. mm -hmm. um, which is why I'm a big advocate of not hitting deer in the front, in front of the shoulder, these neck and head hits, I just don't like them. But um, so it turns out, oh, yeah, well, I did shoot it again with my hand gone after it got up. Well, <laughs> it'd be nice if you told me these things, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> but... Now, for a non-hunter, what is the, why is a high back hit a problem? Um, for none, ah, oh, this is a great, I hope lots of hunters listen to this, because this is a really important shot, and I, I let a lot of those go, and please always still be honest with me anyway, because I just hate running through the woods for two miles with no result. When you hit the spine of the deer, you don't need a tracker. That animal goes down instantly, it's paralyzed, it cannot go another step. Mm -hmm. If ever you have a hit where your deer just absolutely flips over on its back or and struggles the legs are scrambling upwards and it, it or that's one scenario or it completely passes out say you you shot your deer and you it's not moving i always suggest to people to put one more bullet in right then and there because above the spine there's these things that called spinous processes. They're little, they're these spikes that stick up from the spine. Mm -hmm. When you hit just above the spine and you blow out one of these spinous processes, there is an electric current that goes in the spine that, is, that hits a deer like it just got hit by a cattle prod. Or, um, you know, they go instantly to the ground. They've been known to pass out for as long as five minutes. I, there's a story of one hunter that got out of his tree stand. Well, good, I got a good go right in the heart. And they got off the tree stand. They walked over to the buck. They rearranged it. They put they put the gun on top of the antlers. He backed up to take a picture with his <laughs> camera. And the thing came to, and it jumped up. And he never saw the deer again and never found his gun. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and had, on two occasions last year, one was where the gentleman started to roll the deer over to start gutting it, and it came to. A lot of times when a deer goes to the ground in an absolute instant, and I'm not talking the kind where it's a broken leg and it plops down, right. or it, you know, or it spins, runs, falls down. I'm talking it goes boom, and it's down. And... Like I said, sometimes they're on the ground scrambling, the legs go up, and then, then when they do get up, they run a few steps, they fall down again, they run up. They, it's like you just, it's like someone just hit you with a hammer in the spine, and it hurts like hell, but when you recover, you are not anywhere near organ. And they can bleed for two miles, those things, and, but they will not kill the deer. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just urge anybody that has an instant down deer, to just go and put one more bullet in, just to be safe. Yeah, before you start posing for photos, 
<laughs> probably, yeah. All probably right. before you start posing. But this is something that could be helpful to a lot. That would retrieve, retrieve a lot of deer that, deer that don't get retrieved. Because don't, don't forget, now with the rifles, this doesn't happen to bow hunters, by the way. Right, this yeah. only happens to, gun, to rifle hunters. And you, you figure you have this various distance with the gun that's sighted in for a certain distance. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's a little farther, the bullet goes lower, it's a little closer, the bullet goes higher. And you're sort of guessing, you say, well, the steer's far away, so I'm going to aim high. And still you end up with a leg shot because it went too low. I mean, in, in most of these cases, I find that the animals actually hit in the shoulder region. But if you go eight inches up, you get a high spine. If you go eight inches down, you hit a leg. So now you've actually been really good about your shot placement through the scope, and you've had a really steady hand, but it's the way the bullet travels. So let's go over uh, how a hunter knows that he's going to need some help. I mean, he, he sees the hit. Oftentimes, I guess the deer goes right down, and he thinks he's succeeded, and then he goes up to the spot the deer disappeared, and it's not there. Uh, right. So how does a hunter know uh, which kind of hit is more appropriate for calling out a tracker? Well, the first thing is really to check the hit site. You know, and don't be bashful. Stick your hand in what you got, smell it, and see if you have any paunch smell. Mm -hmm. Um, That would be a real good indicator to flag the area, get out, and say maybe, um, you know, maybe I need to just wait and I'll go in later. They can either call a tracker right away. We love taking paunch hits because they, we can find deer, especially if it's been left alone. Say they go to the hit side and they have a bone hit deer, they have bone on the site and call a tracker right away because you can push it a whole lot faster with a dog mm-hmm. than, you know, and everything else, you know, it, it, oh, what kind of injury you have largely has to do with, you know, you, you can put the pieces together between how the animal reacted. Tell me about that. I mean, how, what reaction are you looking for when you're interviewing somebody? Well, for example, you get an archery hit with a, a paunch deer. They, they tend to hump up like you just got hit in the stomach, Mm -hmm. you know, and they often go out slowly. You know, your deer has a tail, your deer doesn't react as a tail up and runs like hell. Doesn't mean it's not a bad, doesn't mean it's not a fatal hit, but I I like them with their tail down and not moving so fast, you know. You see them waver a little, uh, you know, there's different reactions in the deer that, tell you a little bit about it's too many to like go into on top of my head it's right yeah. when people start talking um i get a little bit better and better a picture of what actually happened and mm-hmm. then you know you look at the quality of the blood you know i get uh, wow i've got really frosty blood well blood can frost just because a wound opens and closes in the coat of the deer and causes bubbles it doesn't mean you have frosty blood you necessarily have lung you know, yeah. the, the color of the blood, and people say it's really dark. You differentiate, is it dark because it came out dark, or is it dark because, um, you know, because dark can be liver, or is it dark because uh, because you've tracked it for yay far and you're starting to have clotting agent in the blood, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, clotting uh, is once again one of those things where you say, well, the healing mechanism kicks in doesn't mean the deer is going to survive. It just means it's trying to heal. So right. like on the leg hit deer, it starts to clod. You push a little harder, <laughs> you know. So as a general rule of thumb, if you get a bone hit, the sooner a tracker gets there, the better. If it's gotcha. a punch hit, you may have to wait for that deer to settle down in a place and die. The longer you wait, the better. And, you know, granted, it's nighttime. You have you know, coyotes out there, you don't necessarily want to wait till the next morning. It, you know, we are actually licensed to dispatch animal at night, and and for w- those of us that also hold a job, it's actually nice for us to go out at night. But if, you, you know, someone calls me and says, I shot a deer at 4 o'clock with a 30-odd 6, and I got some paunch matter on the hit side, I go, you know, that deer should be dead in four hours. Why don't I come out at 8 and track it for you? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it's good to call sooner for any hit, because especially being that we're busy. Yeah, um, I suppose lot. that's true. So so basically you you can act as a consultant and tell them what to do and how long to wait just based on the interview. 
Yes. Well, I can offer my advice. Well, great. That's exactly the information I was looking for, and it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Good luck, and we'll talk again. Yes, we will. Suzanne Hamilton is a blood tracker. She and her dogs can find deer that others can't. And when you think about it, she's right. A successful hunter might track a deer once a year. Suzanne does it dozens and dozens of times. Nobody gets more practice. Well, Thanksgiving is coming up this week. For most people, turkey is on the menu. For some, it might be a different part of the fall harvest. Danny Corvo is a nationally known wild game chef, specializing in free-range cuisine. He's made it a passion to turn that into something fancy. The Wild Chef will be my guest next week. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine now airs twice each weekend, Saturday morning at 9 a.m. and Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And it's archived with all the previous shows on the website at 929theticket.com. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Dice Arts, EBS, and Napa Auto Parts. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket.